The star studded sky, suburb and mysterious. It shines with myriads of stars and is an everlasting attraction. It is not an easy matter to gaze at the stars in a nowadays megapolis, but one can see them very well indeed on the dome of the planetarium. And not only stars of the Moscow sky, and not stars alone. The Moscow Planetarium, one of the oldest establishments of the kind in the world, recently celebrated its second birth. For the first time it was opened in 1929 and it became an immersive event for the whole of the country. The building of the Moscow Star House was designed by Mikhail Barch and Mikhail Sinevsky, young architects who were later to become professors of the Moscow Architectural Institute. The egg-like, constructivistic building they created inspired even the greatest of authors. Vladimir Mayakovsky wrote, Every proletarian ought to visit planetarium. Since the very moment of its birth, the planetarium became a real temple of sciences. Up to 500 school children a year studied in its famous astronomical circles, or hobby groups. Many gradients of the circles make the crown jewels of the astronomical sciences of nowadays. During the Second World War, fighting pilots came to the planetarium in order to learn to find their position by the stars. When the Soviet Union started on the outer space exploration, the lessons in astronavigation for the first cosmonauts were held here. Alexey Leonov, pilot cosmonaut in the course of his speech held in the Star Hall of the Planetarium, said, The way to Baikonur for me started here in the Moscow Planetarium. The cosmonautics was in progress and our planetarium also was enjoying a great boom. At all times, becoming a cosmonaut was a dream for so many people. From 1929 and up to the time it was closed, about 50 million visitors came to the Moscow Planetarium. In the 90s, the planetarium was closed for reconstruction. The value of astronomy dwindled considerably in the public eye. And on the 12th of July 2011, after the 17-year-long reconstruction, the Moscow Planetarium was opened for public once again. The floor area was enlarged nearly six-fold, from 3,000 square meters to 17. Its capacity now is about a thousand visitors at a time. The most outstanding feature of Moscow Planetarium is its multifunctionality and being crammed full with technological devices. It is the first smart building with the most advanced equipment and unique technologies installed. The most state-of-art systems of the type are installed in the planetarium. The star sky projector, the full dome projection system, the equipment of the 4D movie theater, and the museum with a great number of interactive exhibits are unequaled in Russia. The planetarium not only promotes the development of science and culture, but it also facilitates upgrading of other planetariums of the country. Different educational shows are complemented by the museum events and exhibitions, as well as with the educational and scientific activities of the widest range. The Moscow Planetarium is a unique multifunctional facility with a state-of-art equipment. At present, there are no other centers of the kind in Russia that may be compared to the Moscow Planetarium. The Planetarium of the present day is a multifunctional complex. The grand and the small star halls, the traditional and the interactive museums, the astronomical sites and observatories, 4D movie theater, a gift shop, and several cozy cafes.
but essentially the Moscow Planetarium is, as it used to be, a unique educational center for promoting natural sciences. Any visitor here may launch a missile into outer space, touch the moon and observe origination of a very real tornado. So let us start the most fascinating journey along the rooms of the biggest Russian planetarium. The hospitable star house. In the historical part of the planetarium, there is a traditional style museum, named after the legendary patron of astronomy, the sky muse Urania. The museum's rooms are located in two levels. The floor area is more than a thousand square meters. What is the first level of the museum now? Served as the basement in the old days and the second level used to be the lobby. In the 2003-2004, the planetarium building showed a growth of 6 meters in two months. The memento of that event is the 6-meter hoisting pillar used for elevating the building is behind the glass now. The displays of the first level are devoted to the history of the planetarium, the development of the science of astronomy, and the methods of studying the Earth in the outer space. In the middle of the room we see the astronomer, a scholar learned in all sciences of the early Renaissance. The astronomer is pondering over something in his study. Who knows, he might be thinking over the greatest secrets of the universe at this very moment. In the back of his study you may see the first model of the celestial sphere. It is called Armillary Sphere. It is one of the ancient astronomical tools. It is with it that celestial goddess Urania is usually depicted. Invention of the Armillary Sphere is traditionally attributed to geometer Eratosphenes of the ancient Greece, who lived in the 3rd century BC. With the help of this device, astronomers of the past ages found equatorial and ecliptic coordinates of stars and planets. Later, Armillary Sphere was used as teacher's aid for the study of the main circles of the celestial sphere. Equatorial sundial is an ancient device for knowing the time of the day by the sun. Sundial presumably is one of the oldest scientific instruments that survived till our time unchanged and that may be the first case of man applying his knowledge of celestial bodies' movements to practical matters. Above the head of the astronomer there is a star globe, a big black metal ball with a lamp inside. If you look closely, you'll see a lot of small holes of different sizes. These twinkling points correspond with the positions of stars on the celestial sphere. The ancient star globe is the prototype of the modern planetarium projector. In the evening, when the lights are switched off, the globe turns the ceiling and the walls into an artificial star-studded sky. On the pillars of the study, there are old engravings dealing with astronomical subjects, which tell us how the men of the 16th, 17th centuries imagined the structure of the world. These engravings show a model of the celestial sphere, the worlds of the solar system planets, and different celestial phenomena. In the glass cabinets all around, old astronomical books, star maps, and sky atlases are displayed. They offer us a chance to get acquainted with the library of a scholar. One of the central cabinets is a modern virtual library. 
With the help of such a multimedia sensor device, one may learn the contents of the books in the cabinets and have a better look at the illustrations. The star globe of the outstanding Polish astronomer Jan Hevelius is displayed in the traditional style Uranium Museum. It's impossible to pass over this great golden globe, on which the constellations known in the 17th century are depicted. There are 1,564 stars from Jan Hevelius' star catalogue, which he made in 1687 with the help of his sextant of his own making, marked on this globe. All these stars, visible to naked eye, are comprised into 54 constellations. Picturesque forms Jan Hevelius attributed to the constellations became canonical and are well known to many people. Even now the constellations are depicted as they were first drawn by the Polish astronomer. To the right of the entrance, there is a section on the history of the planetarium. Rare photographs, documents, books, pieces of the old stained glass windows and models of spaceships. All these unique exhibits illustrate outstanding events of the complicated history of the Moscow Planetarium from 1929 up until now. The honorable award that was bestowed upon the Moscow Planetarium on its 50th anniversary, the Order of the Red Banner of Labor, is also displayed in this section. Here we have two very striking historical exhibits, the two previous planetarium mechanisms. Their production serial numbers are somewhat alike, 13 and 313. What is a planetarium? Planetarium is the name for a projecting device with the help of which one can, whatever the time of the day or the weather, project on the dome screen artificial star-studded sky. Traditionally, the whole complex that houses such a projector receives its name and is also called planetarium. The projector, a complex optical-mechanical device, was invented in 1923. Walter Borsfield, a German physicist, engineer and architect, succeeded in creating the first device. Both our devices, Planetarium No. 13 and Planetarium No. 313, were manufactured in Germany by the world-famous optical firm Carl Zeiss Jena. These very devices had been displaying artificial night sky on the dome screen of the Moscow Planetarium in different periods of its history. The first device, its projector Planetarium No. 13, installed in 1929. It was the 13th device of the kind in the world. Unfortunately, not all the components of the machine survived. The surviving parts, two black balls with shining brass plates around the lenses, now displayed on the stand, look like some mysterious objects from the outer space. Originally, the projector had the shape of a dumbbell, the two big star balls, which had diameter about 75 cm each. One ball projected the stars of the southern hemisphere, the second projected of the northern. All in all, there were more than 6,500 stars projected on the screen. Each of the star balls contains 16 projection lanterns, on the surface, we see only their lenses. But if we look inside, we may see the construction. We see a huge, powerful 1000 watt lamp that gives light for all the projection, that gives light for all the projection lanterns. There are as many lenses as there are lanterns, 16. 
the 13th machine of the Tsai second planetary model, had been displaying star-studded sky for nearly 50 years. In 1977, it was replaced with a new, bigger, sixth model device that was manufactured specially for Moscow. Projector number 313 was the first planetarium in the world to have automatic control system. As to the appearance, there was little change. Like its predecessor, it had two big star balls connected by the framework, motors, projectors. The difference was in the quality, the most advanced optics, electronic stuffing, additional display options. All that allowed creation of something quite brand new for planetarium shows, automated audio-visual programs. Before that, stars cast on the dome screen looked like circles of different diameter. With that new device, the look of the artificial star-studded sky changed. Now it became in fact undistinguishable from the real thing. Today, the device installed in the Grand Star Hall is the state-of-art projector, Universarium M9. It continues the predecessor's traditions, but on a new technological level. Amazing, but the serial number of the new Star Sky projector is 613. For many centuries, knowledge of astronomy not only enabled man to understand the ways of the universe, but also helped him in his everyday life to measure time, for example, or for orientation purposes. On the first level of the traditional uranium museum, there are displayed in the glass cabinets ancient astronomical tools from the planetarium funds, beginning with the sundials and the simplest angle measuring tools and up to the universal tools and telescopes. Take special notice on this sextant. This astronomical tool is used to measure angles between any two visible objects. Usually sextants are used for measuring the altitude of a celestial body above the horizon in order to learn the terrestrial coordinates. For example, measuring the altitude of the Sun at noon, one can calculate the latitude of a place. The scale of sextant has a length of one-sixth of turn, or 60 degrees. Hence, the name of the tool, sextants, sextantes, means one-sixth in Latin. Angle measuring tools developed, and there appeared theodolites, precision instruments for measuring angles in vertical and horizontal planes. The basic principle of theodolite measurements is combining measurements of vertical and horizontal angles. Theodolites became widely spread in astronomy, in surveying, in engineering, therefore there are so very many different kinds of this instrument. Those used for meteorological purposes, by geologists, for geodesic surveys, optical theodolites. In geodesy, for example, they use theodolites to measure great distances on the surface of the Earth. The most important astronomical instrument for observing celestial bodies is the telescope. Here we have a 19th century reflector telescope of the Doland manufacturer that has the 4.5 inch main mirror. John Doland, the English optician, and later his son Peter Doland, produced telescopes on commercial scale since 1789. A lot of interesting discoveries were made with the help of Dolan telescopes. In 1761, Mikhail Lomonosov, while observing Venus transit across the disk of the Sun through Dolan telescope, proved that this planet has atmosphere. One more interesting exhibit, a 1 to 10 scale model of the biggest in Europe, 
Reflecting Telescope, Shine Miro Telescope. This telescope is named after the author of the concept, Grigory Abramovich Shine, member of the Academy of Sciences. Shine's Miro Telescope is the main instrument of the Crimean Astrophysical Observatory. This universal tool, equipped with wide range of devices, was designed to meet requirements of different astrophysical tasks. In front of the Shine Miro Telescope model, we see a small spherical mirror that helps us to demonstrate how the image of a celestial body is formed at a focal plane of the telescope. In the history of telescope making, the invention of glass mirrors was crucial. It opened a new era of the outer space exploration. The topic of astronomical tools usage is continued by the marine corner, which is styled to resemble a ship. In the glass cabinets you may see geographical and star maps, as well as the instruments necessary in sea voyages, sextant, marine chronometer, barograph, spyglass and boat compass. Knowledge of the star sky, as well as instruments like these, were absolutely necessary for the seafaring man, especially in the age of discovery, that made our world wider and more interesting. The second level of the Uranium Museum is what used to be the lobby of the Moscow Planetarium. What a grand view! Far corners of the universe, the world of celestial bodies. Huge stained glass windows open for us mysteries of the outer space. And on this marble ramp there is a scale model of the solar system with the half spheres of the planets and the shining sun. There's also a wonderful collection of relief globes. Those of the Earth, the Moon and Mars are relics of the Soviet epoch. But the globe of Venus was made quite recently. It was based on the modern digital model of the planet's relief. They have something in common, our nearest space neighbors. But each one is unique in its own way. solid moon with its dark seas, light continents and craters of different sizes. Red mysterious Mars with gigantic volcanoes, endless labyrinths and polar ice caps. Enigmatic Venus without its cloud cover, with its petrified flows of volcano lava, high plateaus and whole highland countries. And of course our beautiful Earth, the most picturesque of all. Dark blue seas and oceans, light blue rivers and lakes, golden deserts, green forests and white snow plains. The one and only one live planet. And now you see the most expensive part of the Uranium Museum exhibits. Over 200 kilos of stones of extraterrestrial origin. The Planetarium's Meteorite Collection is the biggest such collection open to public in Russia. Here are 113 very real extraterrestrials. Queer shapes and melted sides are the total landing collected by the Earth atmosphere. Daily, the mass of the Earth increases by 5 metric tons because of the meteorites falling. Of iron, stony, of stone and iron. Most of the meteorites are the shards of asteroids. But some of them got to Earth from the Moon or even from Mars. For example, this shard of Mars that weighs 5.2 gram before becoming part of this collection has covered about 60 million kilometers. The biggest of the meteorites 
are put together to make a picturesque hillock. The heaviest of them weighs 124 kilos. There is a belief that if you touch a meteorite and make a wish, your wish will come true. We go up the main staircase decorated with a graphic composition that illustrates the evolution of the universe and find ourselves under the colossal star dome. The Grand Star Hall of the Moscow Planetarium was built on the basis of the most advanced technologies and its capacity is 356 seats. The projection screen of the Star Hall is the huge dome that has 25 meters in diameter and the surface of 1000 square meters. This dome, the biggest in Europe, was made and assembled in such a way that we see it as a seamless screen. In the middle of the star hall, there is installed the very state-of-art optical fiber night sky projector, Universarium M9. The miracle of technology weighs nearly a thousand and a half kilos. On its surface there are 32 lenses that project more than 9,000 stars on the dome. In reality, a star-studded sky like this can be seen only in a very fine weather and only very high up in the mountains. But the most important thing is not the quality of the picture, but its content. Universarium M9 allows us to travel not only in space, but in time too. Do you know what was the night sky like on the day you were born? And what it will be in a hundred or a thousand years? Universarium may answer these questions with a picture, and in a couple of minutes too. The range of the dates is impressive. 10,000 years. Besides Universarium, there are several other projection systems in the Grand Star Hall. The full dome, the panoramic and the stereo systems. The combination of the advanced optical fiber and projection equipment makes a powerful, intelligent system. Such equipment configuration as we have in the Grand Star Hall is unparalleled in Russia and puts us in the top five of the full dome systems of the world. It is precisely this part of the modern planetarium equipment that allows us to experience the inimitable effect of penetration into outer space when we make our breathtaking trip across the universe. In order to avoid shades cast by the video projector's rays when the full dome system is functioning, Universarium is lowered beneath the horizon of the dome. A special elevator is used for the purpose, which can go more than two meters down. For the convenience of the spectators, the Rhine sold special reclining chairs in the Grand Star Hall. The design of those seats allows spectators to watch full dome planetarium programs with the maximum comfort. Full dome programs of the planetarium consists of two parts. The main part is the Under the Sky of the Planetarium show that introduces viewers to the outer space, allows Magic Star Projector Universarium to show its capabilities in full. The sun goes slowly beyond the horizon and night falls, one by one, stars appear in the sky. Out comes our eternal satellite, the Moon, then the planets of the solar system, then the Milky Way lights up. Familiar shapes of the constellation become clearly visible 
on the heavenly dome. Fasten your seatbelts. We are space-born. We are approaching the very edge of the universe. And return back to Earth to watch the full sun eclipse of 2116 in Moscow. And now, attention! Only here and now, while admiring the fireworks of the meteor shower, we may make our dearest wish. The second part of the Grand Star Hall program offers us one of the educational films that was shot specially for show on the Planetarium Dome. For example, film Two Pieces of Glass, the amazing telescope, will tell us about the history of the telescope. 400 years ago, Galileo Galilei, an Italian, having fixed two pieces of glass inside a tube, which turned it into an eyeglass, one fine January evening of 1610, pointed that tube at Jupiter and became the first man in history to use a telescope for studying celestial bodies. The most prominent discoveries of the past were made with the help of this astronomical instrument. And discoveries are made today too. How many interesting things one may learn just looking through the telescope, the simplest and the most effective scientific tool that threw open the doors to the universe for humanity. One can see not only the details, but the real color of the celestial bodies. One can measure temperature of the stars and learn what chemical elements are present in their topmost layers. In the beginning of the 20th century, astronomer Edwin Hubble, with the help of a telescope, managed to find out that our universe is expanding. It is amazing. Just pointing two pieces of glass at the sky, humanity started on the greatest in its history voyage along the path of exploring and understanding the universe. The film will introduce us to different kinds of modern optical telescopes, both terrestrial and space ones. Join the breathtaking observations made with the help of the world's largest telescopes and you'll be able to look into the depth of the universe, see its past, understand its present and unveil the future. Moscow Planetarium's repertoire includes only the very best of the world programs. One, the unbelievable voyage to stars, let us discover a very new understanding of the space. The other, space collisions, will unveil the mystery of the Moon's origin and tell us about possible collision of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and the nearest to us, Andromeda Galaxy. Film Black Holes, the backside of the universe, will help us make a journey to the center of the Milky Way and unveil all mysteries concerning exploration of the black holes. And the program Stars Talking About Love is an lyrical and even philosophical key. Love and loyalty, low cunning and betrays. It looks like passions are no joking matter both for Earth and in the sky. Interactive Museum Lunarium is one of the two planetarium's museums. One can hardly call it a museum, in fact, because it is not a usual collection of exhibits, but a place of face-to-face -face encounter with the huge universe in all its astronomical and physical diversity. Lunarium consists of 90 exhibits that are placed on the 4,000 square meters of floors 
and on that great premises there is not a single warning. Please do not touch. Instead, there is a great quantity of buttons, handles and levers that visitors not only may touch, but are requested to do so. In that way, which is more like playing an interesting game, the museum's visitors, whatever their age, study the laws of the physics and mysteries of the universe. That is why on the premises of the interactive museum, Lunarium, every single moment of time something falls or flies into the air, sways or swirls, turns around, sparkles or creates optical illusions. All the exhibits here are made to order. To make this collection, planetarium staff has traveled the length and breadth of half the world. An item of special pride is the 1000 kilo heavy half sphere of the Moon, a precise copy of the visible part of our natural satellite. Of course, it is 700,000 times less than the origin. It is based on the most up-to-date digital model of the Moon. Each of Lunarium's two levels has some inimitable peculiarity. For example, exhibits of the section Understanding the Space is styled like a space station. Moving from one module to another, we do some work in Luna Laboratory, get acquainted with the history of the Big Bang, and even make a journey into the infinity. And wherever we find ourselves, on the Moon, on Mars, or in any other place of the universe, we'll be carrying out lots and lots of experiments. We will make observations using different types of telescopes, learn what properties of vacuum are, watch objects being weightless, save a planet from asteroids, send a message to extraterrestrials, and have a hand in experimenting with the appearance of extraterrestrial inhabiting planets with different environments. Launching a missile, an air or a hydrogen one, will demand some hard work too, but our efforts are sure to be gratified. Only 14 seconds and the missile is airborne in the most spectacular way. No less spectacular looks the plasma tower. Visitors always are crowding around it. Plasma is the fourth, the most widespread, state of matter in the universe. The other three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas, make only about 1% of the material objects in the universe. For example, our Sun may be seen as a gigantic clot of hot plasma. Stars, nebulas and galaxies are made of plasma. Even space between them is filled with plasma. There is one quite a unique exhibit on display, the Wilson Chamber. We live in space that is pierced by invisible floors of charged particles that come from the depth of the universe. In the Wilson Chamber, we see their tracks. This happens because oversaturated vapor condenses into the tiniest drops of liquid along the paths of motion of these high-energy elementary particles that make natural radiation on the surface of the Earth and in the atmosphere. That was space physics. Nearby, in the lower level of the Lunarium Museum, there are quite earthly experiments in store for us. Section Astronomy and Physics represents the amazing world of the sciences. Each and every exhibit here is a real scientific laboratory. And each and every visitor is a gifted researcher. Nobody ever found this place boring. The 
the most complicated manifestations of the laws of nature, here at Lunarium, look like fairy tale magic. Don't be shy. Try yourself at composing some galactic music for the Star Ball. And after winning the contest of jumping on the moon, learn what your weight is on each of the planets of the solar system. It will be the greatest on Jupiter and the smallest on Pluto. Some exhibits, like Telluri, for example, may provoke not only curiosity, but quite a number of questions. That is why each of the exhibits in the museum is provided with a colorful player card with explanations. And if your research comes to a deadlock, don't be upset. Sympathetic Lunarium Museum guides will explain to you the purpose and method of operation of all the devices. One of the most interesting experiments is a Foucault pendulum. It serves to prove experimentally that the Earth rotates. It is known that a pendulum, if motioned from the equilibrium position, will swing in one and the same plane till it stops. This property of the pendulum was used to prove that our planet rotates around its own axis by Jean-Bernard Leon Foucault. The first public demonstration of his experiment took place in the middle of the 19th century in one of the highest buildings of Paris, the Pantheon. Our demonstration repeats that experiment exactly. A small figurine is placed on the circle scale under the pendulum in such a way that the swinging pendulum wouldn't touch it. To avoid unwanted sideway motion, we launch the pendulum by means of burning the thread. Then for some minutes we observe the swinging plane of the pendulum rotate, getting closer and closer to the Lego figurine, till at last the pendulum knocks the figurine down. But the swinging plane of the pendulum stays unchanged in space. That means that it was the Earth that had rotated a little bit around its axis, together with the Earth, the spectators, and the floor under their feet, had moved too. So had the tour that was knocked down. Our experiment was successful. We have proved that our Earth rotates around its axis. One of the most popular exhibits is the Plasma Bowl. If you would dare put your hand close to the sphere, you're sure to see a discharge localized near the place where you touched it. The beautiful plasma flows going through the sphere are essentially artificial lightnings, similar to those we see during a storm. In the center of the glass sphere, there is an electrode ellipse with 10,000 volt. Because of that high voltage, there happens puncture of the dielectric medium, which we see as intricate plasma threads. And this device is called Cloud Generator. This model shows how real clouds are formed in real atmosphere. The rubber membrane is pressed abruptly and a little cloud of vapor flies out of the round opening. The next exhibit demonstrates a regeneration mechanism of a whirlwind, a tornado that comes to life inside a storm cumulonimbus cloud. These violently rotating columns of air occur when atmospheric conditions are very unstable, when the air in the lower layers is very warm and humid, and in the upper layers 
it is dry and cold. Here we have one more gigantic vortex. This exhibit shows what happens to a celestial body when it gets into a black hole. Nothing can withstand its power, even light. Black hole is a peculiar region of space where gravitation becomes so great that even rays of light cannot escape it. You can spend a whole day in the interactive museum. It offers a real feast for lively imagination and inquisitive mind. A magical kaleidoscope of interesting experiments and unforgettable discoveries. It is when in Lunarium that you understand clearly that true knowledge indeed gets born from experiments and observations. One more pleasant surprise for our visitors is the 4D movie theater. One can hardly impress anybody with a 3D image nowadays. That is why the planetarium stuff put the emphasis on equality. You feel that remarkable quality of the interior arrangements in everything. The spacious hall with comfortable seats, where visitors get a chance to experience the sense of abruptly increasing acceleration, of flying in the air, falling down in an abyss, as well as tactile sensations. Snowflakes and raindrops, fitful wind and plumps of smoke and even smells It is just impossible not to believe in the reality of things happening on the screen. After the reconstruction, a mini studio started to function in the planetarium, the small star hall. This room serves not only for making our own full dome programs, but also for showing educational films. The small star hall of the Moscow Planetarium is the only place in Russia where a spectator may become a character of the film without special stereo spectacles. The secret lies in the very special form of the semispherical screen. It is by no means an accident that the screen is tilted and the angle is 160 degrees. In such a position, the spectator loses the sense of the projected picture border lines. The mind experiences the so-called pseudo-stereo effect when objects seem to get volume and hover in the air. The one and only in the world, Sky Park, is another item of interest in the planetarium. A broad range of astronomical instruments and devices is located in the open air. The idea of this remarkable park was conceived by Moscow astronomers on the planetarium stuff as early as in 1939 
In 1941, the project was approved, but the Second World War altered a lot of things. So, the astronomical site of the Moscow Planetarium was opened only in 1947 to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the capital. In 2005-2010, the unique museum on the roof of the planetarium was reconstructed on a new technological level on the basis of the drafts by and under general management of Stanislav Vasilievich Shorokov, planetarium scientific consultant. In the course of the large-scale reconstruction, the lists of the exhibits increased considerably. There appeared some things from the world centers of the stargazing civilization, in the form of the models, of course. One of such models is in front of you in the moment. It is a 1 to 5 scaled model of the famous obelisk of the Egyptian queen Hatshepsut that was erected a thousand and a half years BC. Noman, which is a vertical column erected on a leveled ground, is an ancient astronomical sun instrument. At noon of the day, its shadow is the shortest. It will coincide with the geographical meridian or, or line of longitude and shows direction south, north, precisely. If we follow the movement of the gnomon's shadow during the day, we will see that it goes around the obelisk with the sun, or clockwise. During the first part of the day, the shadow gets shorter and shorter. And in the afternoon, it gets longer in the like manner. There isn't an easier task in the world than to turn a gnomon into a sundial. For that, you need to tilt its vertical stuff to the north. That is how the great horizontal sundial was made, which is built in the form of a stylobate monument to the conquerors of space, near the All Russia Exhibition Center. This candidate for a gnomon is located at the point where Prospect Mira forks. It is erected along the meridian, according to the requirements, but it is tilted to the south and thus not fit to be a sundial. The arrow-like monument was built by Mikhail Osipovich Barsh, the same architect that built the planetarium. We bent Barsh's stalobate through zenith to Polaris, put the dial on the ground and got ourselves a horizontal sundial, one of the biggest in Europe. The height of the instrument, as well as the height of the Queen Hatshepsut Noman, is 5 meters, 35 centimeters. The diameter of the dial is 12 meters. Every other of the hours is marked with figures, even numbers only. The smallest graduation is 10 minutes. Here we have one more model of a sundial the Indian winged stairs into the sky, Samrat Yantra. In this structure, the rails of the stairs that lead up to the Polaris are the gnomons. In the morning, the left rail casts shadow on the west wing of the dial. At noon, when the sun is on the meridian, both the scales are lighted completely and in the afternoon, the right rail starts indicating the time. The dial is similar to the rim of the wheel, the axis of which is the rails. As to the appearances, our model of this historical sundial differs considerably from the original. First, here in the north, Polaris stands about twice as high above the horizon if compared to India. Therefore, the staircase turned out twice as steep. Secondly, the Indians had the curves of the dial spread to each side making 90 degrees and work as the sundial sunrise to sunset. Our device is limited by the two curves of 60 degrees, which is 4 plus 4 hours of work. But in spite of all these differences, the operating functions of this device and its traditional form are preserved.
The most popular thing in our days is the analemma sundial. The time may be known by the shadow of an interactive vertical gnomon, the role that any one of us may take upon oneself. In order to know what time is it now, one must just stand on the name of the current month. The names are cut on the specially calculated scale. The shadow will show the time. The Sky Park is indeed the city of the sun. All exhibits here work in collaboration with the celestial bodies. The armillary sphere, one of the most complex astronomical instruments of the ancient times, is no exception. The sphere became to be applied extensively in Alexandria of Egypt. They used it to measure curves and angles in the sky from the time about 300 years before Christ. But mostly, Amula was used to measure the visible motions of the Sun, the Moon and the planets among the stars, more complex than simple rotation of the starry sky. The device in front of us is the Tsvetov's armillary sphere. It was built right here, at the astronomical site of the planetarium, in 1947, by Ruvim Ilyich Tsvetov, the managing director of the planetarium. First of all, it is a very large sphere. One can even walk into it. Its rings may be projected to the real sky. Would be hard to think up a better way of demonstrating how conventional astronomical curves correspond with real sky. The authors decorated the sphere with the celestial bodies of the solar system. As a result of it, the Tsvetkov's armula became not only a measuring, but an illustrating device as well. The Sky Park devices unwrap in front of the visitors the fascinating history of the astronomy development. The collection is unique. It includes sundials of different forms and modifications. A working model of the Stone Age Observatory, the Stonehenge, which is the oldest observatory on Earth, terrestrial and celestial globes, a model of the Pyramid of Cheops, Nabokov's umbrella with the non-setting constellations of the northern sky depicted on it, with Polaris in the middle, the Tree of Wandering, Geoscope, Movable Star Map, and the line of Moscow Geographical Meridian. The greatest rarity among the Sky Power exhibits is the descent module of the spacecraft Vostok. Vostok, with Dami Ivan Ivanovich and Doug Zvozdichko on board, was launched on the 23rd of March 1961. Its safe return to Earth opened the gate to space for manned spacecrafts. In 2011, the Vostok descent module, that was part of a private foreign collection at the time, was bought back by Evgeny Yurchenko, the chairman of Popov Investment Promotion Fund. So, on the 12th of June of 2011, this very real artifact from the Soviet space program was handed over to be displayed on the premises of the Moscow Planetarium. While visiting the planetarium, one can see not only the digital stars, 
but the real ones as well. For that purpose, two observatories are located on the astronomical site of the Sky Park. The large one and the small one. The small observatory is meant for serious scientific research, a most up-to-date 400 mm reflector telescope, equipped with everything necessary for remote access and digital data processing, is installed there. As for the main instruments for observations in the planetarium, it is located in the large observatory. It is one of the largest refractor telescopes that general public may have access to. Its weight is about a metric ton. Diameter of the lens is 300 millimeters. The only other similar telescope in Moscow is in the observatory of the Moscow University. Through that powerful refractor, manufactured by Carl Zeiss Jena, each and any of us, any fine evening, may observe the life of the universe. In fine weather, one can clearly see through the telescope the craters on the surface of the Moon and the planets of the solar system. If such is the inclination, one may also discern faraway galaxies, numerous nebulas, globular and open star clusters. Any one of us who had seen the galaxy in the Andromeda constellation through the telescope will know what it's like to be a real astronomer, initiated into the mysteries of the famous Andromeda Nebula, the lights of which has to travel two million years to reach us. No less excitement will fill those who will see through the telescope the gas giant Jupiter, and just like Galileo, will be able to discern the biggest of its satellites. Our tour about the Moscow Planetarium is practically over. We have done a lot. We have got acquainted with the historical exhibits of the Uranium Museum, made many discoveries in the interactive Lunarium, learned to know time by the sun in the Sky Park, and made a breathtaking space journey with the help of an amazing program in the Grand Star Hall. Come again to the planetarium, and we again will start on a journey into the depths of the universe to get new knowledge, new exciting experience. <laughs>